Talking about reconciliation, the first thing is you must admit that we are independent on August 17, 1945. That's the main point. Good evening. My name is Leonard Boy and I will be hosting tonight's event on uh, the shifting perspectives on anti-colonial violence and resistance. Indonesia won the battle for independence and it has been writing its history ever since. In Indonesia, that is. In the Netherlands, there is a whole different narrative and history of coming to terms with our colonial past. I would now like to welcome uh, Marjolein van Pagé. She is a Dutch historian and writer whose previous book was called Banda, the Genocide of Jan Pietersoon Koen. And she now has written a new book, which has been presented this week. It's called Bung Tomo and the Revolution of 1945. Marjolein, in your book, you are trying to understand the disconnect between the Dutch memories of Bung Tomo and the Indonesian perception, on the other hand, uh, and the role of him in the revolution. Welcome. Thank you for, uh, for being here. Can you... Tell us a little bit the, in the way in which Bung Toba is perceived in the Netherlands, because that's another story, I think. In general, most Dutch people have not much knowledge on colonial history in general, let alone on Bung Tomo. But in, let's say, um, communities that are linked to Indonesia, the, that are, have a history there, Bung Tomo is more than known, mm. and he is uh, yeah, perceived as sort of as the personification of all the suffering that people endured in that time. So mm -hmm. they, they, they hold him accountable for uh, many murders that took place in that time, which in the Netherlands is referred to as the Bersiap. Mm. So yeah. on one hand, we are talking about a war hero, and on the other hand, from the Dutch perspe perspective, it's really a terrorist, someone who is responsible for a lot of uh, girls. And I think that is a, something that is not often not acknowledged here or not understand, understood here very well, that we are talking about an occupation that took like 350 years. Mm -hmm. So here we had the occupation of the Germans like for five years and, and that was already, you know, we were happy that they were, that they were going away. So actually it's interesting that Bung Tomo, who is here seen as a very bad person with no uh, uh, feelings or something, that he, after the war, felt responsible for all the uh, Indonesian youth that he encouraged to fight and that died. Right. So he made a tour after, after the war through, throughout East Java to pay a visit to all these, these, these uh, graveyards and to also ask for forgiveness because he felt that, yeah, he felt somehow responsible. But yeah, I think he was not the one responsible for their deaths. Mm. That's the, the, the colonial armies. And then, of course, we also have to talk about the violence that was aimed at civilians, especially the, the CNIL, the Royal Netherlands East Indies Armies, and their families. A lot of also Dutch Indo-Nizian people who lived at the time there. Um, the British came in, as they say, to protect them. Um, what do you think about that violence, which was uh, exposed? It's a logical consequence if you Close are that. coming with violence. It's almost like one and one is two, you know? Like, mm -hmm. we have to understand that the initiative of the occupation is coming from this side of the world. They came with violence from the beginning. My, my, my first book about Banda already ex explains that in yeah. detail, how that went already in 1600. So after so many years. It's just a logical consequence. Um, so, and, and violence is the result of something that, so it's like what you reap is what you, or no, what you sow is, what is so it? So what you sow is what you reap. Yeah, yeah what you reap is, yeah. That's, that's saying. Yeah, you what reap you what you sow. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that part seems, yeah, often not really, mis I see a lot of misunderstanding in the Dutch uh, colonial, or in the Dutch historiography in general. Well, we had a very recent study, huh, the Geluid van Geweld, the resonance of violence. Um, and it was calculated that around 6,000 Indo-European people were the victim of anti-colonial violence. Um, the majority of them civilians. Do you think that is justified in relation to the fact that revolutionary uh, action was needed? What I find remarkable is that it, it is, yeah, so they keep using the word uh, bersiap, they mm -hmm. defend this term, which I think is a colonial term, it's the, it's, it, it is an Indonesian word, bersiap, but in Indonesia it doesn't mean what it means here, and um, so it's a Dutch colonial invention 
to sort of yeah, often to describe this violence as where two parties uh, fight, there are two to blame, as if there is a sort of equality in, in that. I disagree with that. Also, what I find remarkable is that the violence is, is often uh, lumped together. So you have, I think, important distinctions between violence. You have uh, violence that was necessary to defend the uh, the, the newborn uh, in the, the independent state of Indonesia, which, and, and that is all lumped together under the Bersiap as if all Indonesians just were out of their minds and just out of nothing, without reason, started to attack uh, uh, Indo-Europeans, Dutch, and other uh, collaborators of the Dutch. This is not true. There was a lot of, yeah, there was a need to defend the independent state of Indonesia with using violence, otherwise, yeah, the, the occupation would just happen. And besides that, there were indeed also cases of, um, let's say, of uh, revenge, so um, hate crimes that were maybe more, that were maybe not, not really necessary to defend the, the, the newborn state. But also in that case, we have to include, that's what I just said, it's like one on one is two, it's like we have to include where does this originate? Where does this come from? You also write in your book um, ways to address in the way we talk about uh, anti-colonial violence uh, and how we discuss this in the Netherlands, if there is a discussion at all, I think. But how do you perceive that? How do you think we talk about this in the Netherlands? I think the, the problem here is, is that um, there is a lack of, of, of an Indonesian representation. There are Indonesians in the Netherlands, but there is not often in discussions, it is not, uh, people do not realize that it, what it means that we don't have a big Indonesian repre representation and we do not really understand then what it, the consequence uh, of that is for the debate. We lack that voice. We lack, it, we lack the voice, but we don't even notice that the voice isn't there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we often, of course, that is more for, let's say, for white Dutch people, that uh, we do not even distinguish, we don't even know how to the difference between Indies and Indonesian. Mm -hmm. Why for an Indonesian, it's very difficult to, or annoying even, I think, uh, uh, to constantly being uh, um, confused with Indies, the, the Indies community, which mm. is a very different community than being Indonesian and being from the Republic of Indonesia. On the other hand, we see that the consensus has become also in the Netherlands that the uh, Netherlands was on the wrong side of history. Um, if not for the whole colonial project, then at least for sending the army uh, in 1946. Um, but do you understand that, that your book can feel like you are trying to take away the grief of victims who have been on the other side, especially the, the, the Indian people, the Indian people, like you already mentioned? But how do you consider that? How do you, do you sort of understand why it's painful for some mostly Indo-European people to, to have this perspective? Um, first, let me acknowledge that, that uh, yes, when they uh, arrived here, for most Dutch people, they also did not understand their position. No. Most Dutch people had no idea. So I acknowledge yeah. that they experienced racism from the Dutch, yeah. from the white Dutch people. That's why I understand that it must feel also uh, frustrated and etc. But we can, in these recent years, <laughs> when there is more and more attention also for the for the Indies community, like. Even I think a few few years ago, the Dutch government made like uh, quite a mi some million was it 20 million uh, euros available to to recognize the Indies community. Mm -hmm. So let that sink in. It, you cannot uh, have the discussion with only so it, there was a hierarchy, and I think we need a to, hierarchy to, of to, pain to, of, of of feelings. Is no, that what you yeah, mean? Uh, to, no. There was a hierarchy, a, race, a racist hierarchy yeah. that existed in the colony, and that is still visible here in the representation of Indies versus Indonesians versus Maluku people. That 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 apartheid system that la that that was invented invented from the 1850s onwards, of course, the, the laws are not here, but the effect and the way that you, you can see it back in the, in the representation of groups. So, as always, if you focus, history is always more complicated than you think from the outside, even on this, uh, this level. 
Well, Marjolein, thank you so much for, uh, for bringing this on the table and for writing the book. Um, you will be on the first row listening and also reflecting. Um, give her a big hand, Marjolein. Thank you so much. Please take a seat, Adi Sejawan, Robin Rijven, and Vitria Yalita. Uh, very welcome. Thank you. It looks like being between the hammer and the anvil as an Indo, uh, Indonesian coming to the Netherlands in the late 40s, 50s. Um, what do you think of, of, of that sort of perception of what happened? I think it's a story that many of us here in the Netherlands have known. I think it must be nice to be able to tell your story as such, to be able to personify the people, to humanize the people that are actually being called characters in your story. Mm -hmm. Because for, I'm sorry, in Surabaya, there were like more than 15,000 people that are dead. Where are their humanization? And yes, you can tell me that's the responsibility of Indonesians and not ours, but it also has to do with perception, doesn't it? If you humanize one group over another, you will feel more sympathy over one group against another. Mm -hmm. And that makes a lot of things impossible. Is that what happened over the last uh, yes, years? Yes, definitely. Yeah. That is definitely what happened. Yeah. And now we are finally making amends, if you will. Mm -hmm. Finally, we're trying to catch up with the group of people that have been dehumanized, that have been glossed over so many years. Yeah. And uh, with the book of Marjolein, uh, I already told Marjolein about it. it, it felt like, like I was healing my inner child <laughs> because uh, I have been living in the Indonesia um, until I was eight and I, I came here in the Netherlands uh, because of my father's work. Um, I'm Indonesian, so I have been raised Indonesian. Both my parents yeah, are Your parents Indonesian. are Indonesian exactly. and you grew up in the my Netherlands. My father yeah. is Sulawesian from Sulawesi. Yeah. My mother is Javanese yeah. because a lot of people don't understand the concept of being Indonesian. It's a nationality, not an ethnicity. Just like Indies is not a nationality or, or not, um, well, it's not a country, so no, it's not a nationality. Also, it's not an ethnicity. Mm -hmm. It's a political identity. Mm -hmm. Just like Indonesian is a political ad identity, but we do have our country. So mm -hmm. there you go. Okay, and then I think it's very interesting to, to, to understand your per perception in regards to what Robin's saying, people were leaving their country into what they called their motherland, which wasn't theirs at all because they have never been there, not born there. Well, how do, you, how do you look upon that? Well, they relate to the white people. They relate to colonizers. So then, yes, that's your motherland if you feel more related to the colonizers. In relation to the bloodline or the nationality? or Also... Of mm -hmm. course, because there were people who were married to Dutch people or, or had children with Dutch people and then, you know, indigenous uh, people. But we all, the indigenous people, all came from the Southeast Asian archipelago. I keep saying this right. because we keep saying, I mean, in Dutch history telling, we keep saying about former Dutch East Indies. But we never make the notation that that is the term that is used by the colonizer, not by the colonized. Right. So if you want to move away from that, if you want to be objective or neutral, then you say Southeast Asian archipelago, because mm -hmm. that is what it is mm -hmm. and what it was and what it still is. Okay. Um, I think you have a very unique position because living in the Netherlands... with your difficult. Difficult, but yeah. for tonight, a very, I think, unique and very <laughs> interesting position okay. to compare the narratives about this period. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest difference in terms of perception between what you see in the Netherlands and in Indonesia? Okay, I can go on about this forever, well, but let's, let's try keep it to short, yeah, right? Try to focus. Right? I think the fundamental difference of the Indonesian perspective of Dutch colonial history in Indonesia, the country I was born, um, the fundamental difference lies in the fact that uh, the Dutch justify colonialism. And Indonesia is... I mean, it was created out of anti-colonial resistance. We, are, we had to fight for our liberation. So then there is no room to justify colonization, Western imperialism. There is no room to justify that. Mm -hmm. And if you look over the contents of the history, of the perspectives, that is something that you will instantly notice. 
if you speak both languages. And I'm not just saying speak both languages, like speak Dutch and Indonesian, but speak the language of the oppressed and the language of the oppressor. Okay, let's zoom a little bit um, in on the stir we had last year on the exhibition Indonesia. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very interesting example on how the different perspectives are being felt. Um, this was, I think, stirred up because of the term Bersiap. We already mentioned that. Can you tell us what, what in your perspective, happened around that exhibition? Why, what, what do you think stirred such an emotional debate? Well, first of all, it was um, the historian Bonitriana Triana who actually mentioned, um, and actually I was one of the first people he told to that he was not going to use the term Bersiap. It's not going to be in the exhibition. And I was, I was scratching behind my ears, and I was like, are you serious right now? I don't think that's going to happen, sir. I'm sorry, that's never going to happen. You're in the Netherlands, and you're telling me you're making an exhibition about colonial history without mentioning Bersiap? No, that's not going to happen. Mm. And I'm sorry to say, but I was right. They threw him under the bus. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, we don't have anything to do with that. That's his opinion. That's not our opinion. We don't want to hurt anyone here. Mm -hmm. You know, We're just being neutral, objective. Mm -hmm. So we, we say Bersiap. But then I talked to many other historians about Bersiap. I talked to, I mean, actually last September, I was in Indonesia myself. I'm, I'm researching uh, the book that I'm writing right now about Indonesian perspectives of uh, Dutch colonial history, seen from the perspective of my family history, a, a history of resistance, where both the violent and the collaborative resistance can coexist. And um, This is where your book is also This is where focusing. my book, exactly. This right. is where I will focus on, because... Right. Yeah, well, and um, I, I actually spoke to the uh, general director of the Ministry of Education and Culture in Indonesia, and I asked him, don't we have, like, uh, a response to this bersiap, they say? And he says, I'm sorry, but that just doesn't really exist if they only talk of the violence that so-called Indonesian freedom fighters, or pemudas, if they like to talk. Pemudas just means youngsters. We still use this word. So why do you weaponize it? But anyway, it's just a word. And um, when you only refer in Bersiap to the violence that Indonesians, freedom fighters, supposedly caused to the Indo-Dutch, then that's racist. Because seriously, Indonesians were also being attacked by everyone for almost 350 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, there has been debate about that, but definitely over three centuries. And um, you know what? What I notice here is that when, when it comes to Bersiap, it's a fragmentation of history. And what I notice is that the, the, the works of a lot of historians nowadays only focus on 1945 and 1949. Why is that? Because... And you mean not before? Not before. Go back. No, no, no. But also not like, why don't you relate it to everything? I mean, it's being done little by little, but then you, again you come back to 1945, 1949. Why? Why? You, because, say, you, because you, you, you yeah. say you forget the bigger picture in a way. Yes. Well, oh, yeah. purposefully so. Yes. Okay. And I actually um, brought a picture of, uh, and relating to the first question you asked me about the, the major difference between Dutch and Indonesian perspectives of colonial history. This picture over here is um, it's a painting by Nicolas Pineman about the arrest of Pangeran Diponegoro, Prince Diponegoro of Japanese. I guess a lot of Dutch people recognize this one. And that one is the same picture, but written, uh, but, but uh, painted by an Indonesian. Radensale. This one is, exactly, Radensale. This one is painted by an Indonesian. That one is painted by the Dutch. What do you see here? At this um, painting, you see Diponegoro kind of startled. It's, it's a scene about the arrest, so he surrenders. Over here, you see the painting by Radensale, and um, the Indonesian, and, and this is actually a resistance movement because he is painting the Dutch, if you look more closely, he's painting the Dutch without any depth. It's kind of like it's plastered on there. Mm. But the Indonesians, you see over there, the oppressed, they have shadow, they have depth. They are not one dimensional. And that is what you have always done in your history telling about Indonesians. We're always one dimensional. Women are always either objectified or, or weak, or, or, or pitiful, but did, never did, did resistant. Did you say you? Say no, no, no. <laughs> Dutch. <laughs> you the Dutch. You? Right. Yeah. Adi, how do you listen to, to this? Is, is the, you're an historian. Is the term Bersiap of any meaning in today's Indonesia? In Indonesia, if you ask just randomly to people, what is Bersiap? Maybe they, they just don't know. 
It's just a word which means be prepared. That's it. Mm-hmm. But in revolution, he need it. No. I think, yeah. So for us, it's very absurd. What is Persia? A period? If it's a period, then from when till when? Who's the victim? If, if it's a period, it's a time. What about the Surabaya people who just brutally bombed by the British? 15,000 killed. Are they uh, also part of the Persia period? If it's a period. Mm-hmm. If, it, if they're not, isn't it racism? Think about it. It's very absurd. And what would be your advice to a museum like the National Rijksmuseum Museum here in the Netherlands in, in regards to using this term? Yeah. There was no, no term such as Persia Indonesia. Or you want to use this term, that term, so be it. But you must also explain how Indonesia see it. Because for us, for me especially, it's racist. Because I know the story, the whole stories. Right. Okay, and then, because we are all talking about pain tonight, the pain of the racist feeling, the pain of being wiped out of history or yeah. making it flat. And then in regards what I consider be- becoming, between the hammer and the anvil, the group um, Roman is talking about, how do you perceive that? Talking about the pain, I read a lot, a lot about the pain, uh, what happened during the Japanese occupation, and then after that, uh, out from the hell to another hell, revolution. But have you ever think what happened a uh, hundred years before that for us, for Indonesian? Yeah. All of you, you have daughter, son, grandson, granddaughter, five years old, or maybe little sister. Imagine those pure soul, you walk with them, and then they ask you for Boden, for Honden, and Inlander. Why? Why, why they see us as animal? Imagine your daughter, yeah, imagine just your daughter asking you that question. How struck is that? That's only for, it's just one example. How do they dehumanize us? And Robin, how do you look upon that? Because your your grandmothers were, were of course referring to as we were sort of wiped out of paradise. Yeah, well, the, the thing is, uh, you, you said, um, okay, I, I, I recognize the pain of the people who had to go to Holland, but, then we get the word but, do you realize what happened with, with, with our people yeah, for 350 years? I would say not but, but and also that, because what happened to my mother and all those other people is, 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 is terrible. It scarred them for life. But what happened to the Indonesians scarred them for 350 years. And I absolutely recognize that. And I think it's very important not to get tangled into a, a battle of terminology. In my opinion, pain is pain. And uh, of course, some uh, I recognize the, 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 the pain. What did the Dutch do there? Let's start with that. Yeah, yeah Eddie, because then we come more in the now. Yeah. I mean, we cannot change history. You cannot. But again, like I said, and Marjolein said, in 1945 is the year of choice. You can have your choice. Uh-huh. All of you, all in, sorry, all people in the Netherlands, majority, talking about the bad situation from uh, this from perspective. But do you know that we in Indonesia also have the Hindu who choose part as Indonesian. Mm-hmm. They fight for Indonesian. Yeah. They fight for freedom in 1945 in Surabaya. We know in our history book, we know Nono Corford who died in the, in the fight. Ari, are you saying the Dutch sort of missed the opportunity? 
in 1945? Purposefully, purposefully so. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the Dutch missed the opportunity uh, in the, the, f the first uh, the 20, 30 years of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, because the Indonesian political, uh, political parties were coming on strong, but they were cut short all the time. That was the time, the first half of the 20th century, when it had to be done, but it didn't happen. Right. So they missed it twice. Yeah. yeah. On the historical side. If you ask a question in English, I can give you the mic. We talk a lot about reconciliation and yeah, um, we want it. But is that something you'd be interested in? And if not, what are you interested in, if that makes any sense? Talking about reconciliation, the first thing is you must admit that we are independent on August 17, 1945. That's the main point. Yeah. Legally, legally admit. Legally. It's not just talking bullshit here and there, but yeah. So you say if that is really clearly communicated, yeah. clearly said and done, then you sort of can open up a dialogue. Yes, of course. If you want to have a good relationship between two persons, yeah, start to acknowledging each other. I want to thank you all three very, thank very you. much for the opening of a debate which I think will be much longer going to last, especially in the Netherlands. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Give them a big hand. Um, Marjolein, um, you have a sort of a last word. I want to say two things uh, about the, um, maybe for some people it feels as a simplification to talk about perpetrator and victim or about colonized and colonizer. And then people who are from mixed race or from other ethnicities will feel like, but where do I belong, right? But then again, what I think is very important, what Fitria said about it, that uh, these identities, the Indonesian identity, but also Dutch or, or the uh, Indies, they are political identities. And some of these identities are born in racism, in colonialism. And that's uh, where I think there is only one yeah, uh, perspective that is um, legitimate or that is um, morally uh, right. Uh, that is, we are now against colonialism and racism, right? So then some of these identities should be, yeah, maybe... Uh, reconsidered. Yeah, reconsidered, uh, seriously. And that is one point. And then also about the reconciliation discussion. I think it sounds very beautiful. Right now, we know what's happening in Gaza, and we have seen a lot of people posting pictures. I think it's like a, a, you see a young uh, Jewish boy or girl, and then with a very romantic, and, and um, 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 a Palestinian boy or girl sitting together. And then it's so, it's, that, that's actually the, that's actually the information and propaganda because, war. Yeah. Well, people, people who love peace post this. And I think they're all very lovely people who really maybe want peace. But in some occasions, uh, there are two parties, but there is, uh, there is a colonizing party and there is an, uh, a, a party that undergoes this occupation. And then you cannot just equalize it like as if the, the, those who experience the occupation have the same responsibility in being pro-peace because those who experience the occupation are the first who want peace. It's not their responsibility. They undergo it, and they want they want peace. Of course, they want peace. So that is uh, for reconciliation. We need to acknowledge. Yeah, time and again, we keep to see this difference in power balance. And we so, if you we, have to we, give an advice to the Dutch government to open up reconciliation, we have heard already. Recognize the 17th of August. It's that simple. Start really talking, opening up, and plead guilty. What would your advice be above that? Uh, they pay the 4.5 billion guilders that they have stolen from Indonesia in 1949. That would be a start. They don't want to talk about that. But yeah, so my, my most important point, maybe also in this book, is that uh, when we talk about reconciliation or about, it's about also about truth. There is a truth and there are lies. And some things, and I think Bugdomo for me became the, yeah, the personification of this dehumanization that the Dutch did on Indonesians. So criminalize them and their efforts of just wanting independence is being criminalized and Buntoma is a clear example of so that. So information is key and reality in, for example, the book is very important. And thank you for being here. Bye. <laughs>